Okay. Alright, is this good? Can you hear me? Yes. Alright. So, I started playing golf in the fifth grade and was fortunate enough to actually get pretty good uh, rather quickly. Um, I remember the first time I went out and played, I had this brown bag, this old brown bag, uh, had dust on it. Uh, the clubs in it were pretty much put together from a garage sale. I think we actually got it from a priest that would bring uh, secondhand items uh, to my mom to see if she could afford them. Uh, the neighbor up the road actually took my brother and I to uh, the golf course. Uh, it was a late summer day, so there weren't very many days left to, to actually play. And that, that next summer, uh, and it, you know, I really remember that excitement that I had going up there and playing. Uh, my buddy up the road, he actually uh, had a membership and was able to go up there all the time, so I just kind of wanted to uh, do that as well. Um, and I remember that excitement, and that excitement stayed with me for forever because uh, I became addicted. Uh, my neighbor up the road took my brother and I out uh, for that first night, for that first uh, nine holes, and later um, just just remember again how excited I was to, to play. Um, the next year, I got my own set of clubs, and my own set of clubs were these Michael Jordan clubs, and by no means are they clubs that any wealthy kid would be using. Uh, probably some, buy some box store or something like that, and. You know, that was the problem. Uh, we were poor. Uh, we didn't have any money, and I fell in love with a sport that generally had to be rich, uh, wealthy to be able to play. Um, my mom was a single mom. She had five kids. I had three of her sisters and a younger brother. And I was the first boy, so, you know, I thought my mom would be happy that her first son was to play sport, and she was all about me playing an expensive sport. Couldn't be more wrong. Um, <laughs> so, that that year, I uh, you know had my own set of clubs. We had fortunate enough to live on 12 acres of land, and I had a dozen balls. I would hit you know an eight iron, go out and hit out in the field, uh, hit 12 of those, pick them up, bring them back, hit them again, go out, pick them up, and I did that for hours for about a year. And um, the first summer, I got my own golf membership. It's probably the best summer of my life. I was out there 12 hours a day. Um, I just couldn't get enough of it. Um, just out there practicing. And I was, did not get that because my mom, um, you know, saved up money and paid for it. There was a man named Matt Shadow. Matt uh, became a golf mentor of mine. He actually played for my grandfather in, in high school. So there was a, a connection there. Uh, but you know, I looked to him as a as a mentor um, in in golf, uh, pretty much, because he was good in his own right. He played some college, and he was a person I could lean on to to get better. Um, and I learned so many lessons through golf uh, that's you know led me to where I'm at today. But some of those lessons are you learn after the fact. Matt uh, gave me a lesson. I'll never forget a huge part of my life, and it caused for some tough discipline. Um, so we were playing, and we're actually, uh, I had membership for a couple years at this point, and we're on the 14th hole. I hit my drive down the left-hand side, which was lined with trees, pine trees and big oak tree, and I knew, walk up, that I'd play that course over and over and over. I, remember, I knew I had to hit the ball out to the fairway to advance it up to the green and try to make par. And I get up there, once I realized that I was going to be hitting the, the smart shot, getting out the fairway advancing, um, I stood over the ball, took my swing, whack! The ball goes to the other side of the hole behind more trees. And in that moment, I remember I decided I guess I wanted to play baseball, so I took that club swung it against the oak tree. Ting! That half the club went bouncing through the trees and the roots. Had the other part of the, the club in my hand. And Matt turned around, looked at me, walked very briskly to me. He said, what the hell? What are you doing? Why would you do that? And the only response I had was, that shot. 
And he said, was it the club's fault you hit a bad, bad shot? I was like, no. Turned around, went to uh, his ball. He didn't talk to me for the remainder of that hole or the next hole, which is the 15th hole. Um, as soon as we completed that hole, he looked at me and said, go to the clubhouse. Go to the clubhouse. And I knew he was serious in that moment. And I'm thinking, okay, this is not fair. Uh, I'm getting ready, to, we're tied at this point. I have a chance to finally beat you. And you're sending me off to the golf course? Like, that's what's, what's in my head. So I go up to the clubhouse, um, sit in there, wait, you know, 30, 40 minutes while they complete. He comes into the clubhouse, said, let's go outside and talk. And that day he told me, someone's true character comes out on a golf course because you never know who's looking. And in the moments that you don't think anyone's looking, um, those are when the biggest decisions where you have to make the toughest decisions. Um, in your life will come. And you plan on playing this sport for the rest of your life, I need you to understand that. Matt, is, you know, at that day, I, I really understood that Matt was someone there for me. Uh, more than just a golf mentor, he was a person that I could lean on. And to this day, uh, he's part of my family, uh, Jess, Cohen, Ellie, Daxon's our family, and actually my boys call him Grandpa to this day. Thank you. Thank you.